Uh, so a bit about my background, so you know where I'm coming from, because I have a, a kind of weird accent. <laughs> uh, I'm a bit of a foreigner. I am Canadian from Vancouver, but I grew up in the post-industrial wastelands of Las Vegas, uh, which is where this photo is from. Um, it's actually of my brother when he was about four. Uh, that's one of the deserts that was outside our backyard, actually. Um, and these deserts are where a lot of my design inspirations come from, so you'll see a lot of photos of them throughout the presentation. Uh, but I currently live in London, um, where I moved a few years ago to do a master's program uh, where I did an intensive ethnography of about 30 millennial-aged hackers, all women. Uh, they lived all over Europe, they went to hacker conventions, and they hacked different things, software and hardware. And I really wanted to better understand their ideas about gender and identity compared to generations before them. Uh, and from then, I, I worked with the Open Knowledge Foundation's communities for a few years. Um, I organized the world's first Open Knowledge Festival in Helsinki last year, which I think some of you were at. Um, and I also helped facilitate local communities, uh, one of which is members are here, uh, Open Knowledge Foundation Spain, and they're helping promote open data um, in your neck of the woods. Uh, but yeah, I've recently joined Mozilla, as, as was just said, as their new hacking popular culture liaison which is the best job title in the world, I think, <laughs> um, in order to help the next generation of web uh, viewers and web browsers become web makers, which is something I'm quite excited by. And I think something that might excite you guys too as designers. First, a disclaimer. Um, I would like to note that I come at this not as an expert. I am a digital anthropologist by training, and I, I do some design, and I, I you know, work with some machines, but I think you guys are much more experts than me in this field, and I'm really looking forward to learning from you in the next few days and having a discussion with you to further inform my own work. Um, and because I know that you guys already know why open design is important, I'm going to omit that entirely from the presentation. I don't think that's important here. You've already been converted. You're already pioneers. Uh, but the question that still really eludes me in my own work is what is open design today? Not why. I mean, that's something that I think we still need to discuss. That's something that we don't necessarily agree on, and that's either a good or a bad thing, but it's something that means we need to continue having these conversations. And I think everyone really has a bit of a different idea currently of what open design is to them. A lot of people ask me, is it something like this? Which was, you know, the, the Berlin Biennale. They had a, a key focus last year to get people to really participate in new ways. <clears throat> and the Draftsman's Congress was a massive old church that looked like this, where they had covered the walls in white, in white boards and said, draw on them, do whatever you want, write whatever you want, be revolutionary. And it was really interesting to see people get involved who wouldn't normally see themselves as designers. So many people believe that might be open design, is opening up the design field to new, new users. Some people would say, is it, is it fabbing? Is it physical design? Um, this is a guy from Open Design City, which is a public workshop space in Berlin uh, where anyone can make anything. Uh, they quote, from a bioplastic wallet to a lamp made out of sweaters, it's all open. Or is it something like this? Uh, at the Open Knowledge Festival last year, um, one of my colleagues, Massimo Macchinelli, out of Italy, who's a, a key pioneer in the open design movement, decided that he wanted to make all of the name tags uh, open content, um, put all of the prototypes for them online, and let people change their name tags as they wanted, and then print them out in the Fab Lab. Or is it this? Is it, is it just digital design? Is it, is it books about designers for designers? Maybe that's it. Or is it this? Is it designers? This is Massimo again. <laughs> He's going to be angry that I keep using him as an example. <laughs> Is it designers just talking to other designers, uh, doing workshops and learning from each other? Maybe. What I'm saying today is that it is all of these things, and it's also way more. And that's, I think, where things get a bit messy, complicated, and most interesting. Um, and what I'm really interested in today is how do we reconcile previous open design practices from some of you as, as pioneers with some of the newer ones that perhaps we're doing at Mozilla and um, in web literacy groups and with the Open Design Working Group. <laughs> How do we reconcile the pragmatic with the revolutionary, um, the, the single media work with multimedia work? 
so the way I'm going to go about this is looking at a, seven different aspects of the open design field today that I think are increasingly important and will be important <clears throat> in 2013. Sorry about my voice, by the way. <laughs> um, and I invite you guys to debate me with this. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe there isn't seven, maybe there's 50, um, but I think it could at least start an interesting conversation. It's another picture from the, the Draftsman's Congress, which as you'll see, has really inspired me. So the first thing that I would say open design is, in my own experience, is a form of interconnectivity. Uh, the quickest definition of open design that I've seen comes from the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation. And they say, open design is the application of open source methods to the creation of physical products, machines, and systems. So that sounds pretty straightforward, right? But then looking on Wikipedia, you'll see an entirely different definition, that the open design movement currently unites two very different trends. On the one hand, <clears throat> people apply their skills and time to projects for the common good. At the other end of the scale is a, an inclusive effort of designers to implement a common framework amongst themselves for development. And yet, these two strands are not necessarily united. They're not necessarily the same people, nor do they necessarily communicate. I think events like this are a great opportunity for us to have you know, those communications, but I think normally we, we work in very different spaces and there can be quite a chasm. A designer from Israel uh, named Mushan Zeraviv wrote recently, uh, how come the networked collaboration that transformed code production and encyclopedia writing, such as Wikimedia, fails to translate to graphic and interface design? And I think this is something we really need to learn from and, and fix. So I'm gonna show a few examples of groups that I think are trying to fix this currently. Um, the first and most prominent is the Open Design Now book, which I'm sure has inspired us all as designers. It definitely inspired me, um, because it was one of the first real attempts to understand open design across paradigms, and to look for commonalities and ways to keep it from being an exclusive world of skill sharing only for designers, only for those of us who happen to be lucky enough to grow up with computers and you know, learn web design in our, for our spare time. Another example is uh, the Open Design Working Group, which is something that I started with some colleagues, including Massimo. Um, we started in 2012, and it was, we started it with the Open Knowledge Foundation and with the Alto Media Lab um, in Helsinki, uh, which started the first Fab Lab in Finland uh, a few years ago. And it was aimed at uniting the next generation of open designers across paradigms, much as the Open Design book did as an introduction, but we wanted to continue that discussion virtually. Uh, so. We defined open design as from hardware to fabbing to fashion to product design, uh, and we wanted to have conversations about what we share and what we don't in our work. Um, and one of the first things we did was host one of the first ever uh, open de hardware design, manufacturing, making and fabbing topic streams uh, at the Open Knowledge Festival, which was every big a mouthful as it sounds. Um, <laughs> While it was really confusing to explain to people what that topic stream was, I think it was a really good moment for a lot of designers to come together for, some, in, in many cases, the first time to say, well, I just do hardware design and I just do software design. How can we work together? Um, another few examples are the re-campaign. Um, I really love that, that poster, the, the red one. I think it's beautiful. Um, and it was started by some of our friends uh, at the Open Source Hardware and Design Alliance called Ohanda. Um, and the core of this project is a free online service where manufacturers of open hardware and designs can register their products with a common label. Um, and the label is called Reables, and it sort of has that, that re sign and was supposed to be a very distinctive way for designers across paradigms to find out if a product was indeed open design, whatever that means. Um, and we, uh, inspired by the re campaign, we did an experiment called Fab Star last year, which was an attempt to hold regular summits and internal meetings for people who identified as fabbers, as fab labbers, um, to share notes internationally, because we wondered why a lot of fab labs weren't yet. Um, I think that's been changed quite recently with like live streams happening between fab labs, which has been quite exciting. But at the time, um, a lot of the fab labs didn't, didn't know each other yet, so we did a few events around that. Um, another example, which I mean, I'm probably biased because I was a part of this, but I think it's, it's a good example of, of an attempt to start these conversations is the open book. 
um, which was an ambitious and, and somewhat crazy uh, crowdsourced experiment in publishing that we did with the Finnish Institute and the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, and there's over 25 writers, all of whom are leaders in open fields, self-identified leaders in open fields, uh, across very different backgrounds of openness. So people who are open scientists, um, open business people, open designers, um, open educators, and all of these people explaining what openness was to them and how they thought they could collaborate with other fields of openness. The second thing that I see in open design right now is that it's a form of standardization. Um, and that can either be a frustrating form of standardization or an exciting form. Uh, this image is an encoding and decoding image, um, which comes from a 1980 article uh, called Encoding slash Decoding where cultural theorist Stuart Hall defines communication itself in terms of code. Uh, he says that both encoding and decoding are creative processes, and that ideas are transformed into messages and then transformed into ideas yet again, much as what's happening between these two people. Uh, for example, in this picture, the code that Alice uses for encoding is different than the one Bob uses for decoding. And I think this sort of collaborative decoding and discussion process around the, the confusion between these two terms is what inspired us to really reopen the open design definition. Uh, the open design definition, which we've reopened, has a great many influences, uh, a whole web of confusion, you could say, or, or a web of uh, excitement, I guess. Um, so I'll go through them quickly. Uh, the first is obviously that the grandfather, the open source definition, which is one of the first attempts to unite people who are, are coders and hackers and working on similar projects, but don't necessarily have a similar methodology for how they explain those things to the public. Um, the open source hardware definition was a really great community project, which still is very strong. Um, the open design definition draft version 0.01 was the first attempt uh, by a few pioneers to, I'm just checking, um, to engage with open design for the first time. Um, and the, this was in 1999. Uh, it was a few guys from MIT. I'm, I'm sure you guys probably know them better than me, but their work was very inspiring for why we decided to reopen this definition because while it was, it was quite revolutionary in its time in the early 2000s, it, it sadly went obsolete and a bit out of date. So we felt we needed to update it. Um, and when we decided to update it, we wanted to add in the open definition, which is something that was created by the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, and the open definition is one of the first attempts to unite open content and open data practitioners across professional fields, according to the following statement, which is, a piece of content or data is open if anyone is free to use, reuse, and redistribute it without legal or technical restrictions. Uh, that can be a somewhat controversial uh, definition, but it's definitely started a lot of interesting uh, debates. <laughs> um, and our, our renewal of the open design definition, it took into account a lot of the hard questions of our age that we felt weren't yet engaged by its predecessor, by the 1999 version. Um, so what about open data, for example? Um, not really mentioned there. Uh, what about intellectual property, especially in the late 2000s, which is quite a different beast than it was in the early 2000s? Um, what about redesigning and hacking of existing designs via remix cultures and glitch cultures? Also wasn't really mentioned. And what about the many differing branches of design that are all emergent in their own way and see design in very different ways? Um, my colleague did a comic to show how complicated it is for us to explain to people who aren't open designers what the hell we're doing <laughs> with this definition. Um, and we decided because we wanted designers of all kinds to engage with it, not just coders like hacker designers who understand how to code, but also designers who may be a fashion designer who maybe isn't on computers a great deal. We decided to use GitHub as the, the collaborative tool for how people could edit it. Um, and we did a great deal of workshops around the world um, to try to uh, do a brief tutorial of GitHub and how to collaboratively edit a document on GitHub together. Um, which were varying levels of success. I think in certain places, the designers said that GitHub was too difficult for them. It was too high of a barrier. Even, even this uh, sort of software was a bit um, disengaging and a bit disempowering. 
So that started some really interesting discussions about what kind of mediums do we use so that all designers feel included in the conversation. Um, and also this attempt to uh, use GitHub to do this collaborative you know, definition document has caused some quite interesting press. Um, <laughs> I think the most memorable press was Bruce Sterling, uh, who gave a strange condemnation by saying, this will be every bit as exciting as watching people make law and sausage. <laughs> I was impressed by that. <laughs> um, and I think this sort of conflict, which apparently can be controversial for people, uh, brings us to the next phase of design, which is the fact that open design is increasingly a form of politics. It's a political move. And I, I'm proud to say that it is. Uh, this image comes from an infamous condemnation of contemporary design called Fuck Committees, I Believe in Lunatics by uh, <laughs> Tibor Coleman in 1998. I'm sure you guys already know about this, but it's, it's one of my favorite things to reference. It, it's offensive, but I think it really gets to, to the heart of what was pissing people off in the, the early 2000s about the, the design movement. Uh, and he writes that, I'm angry because this is a struggle between individuals with jagged passion in their work and today's faceless corporate committees, which claim to understand the needs of the mass audience and of design, and are yet removing the idiosyncrasies, polishing the jags, creating a thought-free, passion-free, cultural mush that will not be hated nor loved by anyone. I offer a modest solution, find the cracks in the wall and find the lunatics. I would argue that everyone in this room is a, is a lunatic in some way, that's why we're, we're working with open methods and, and open design despite its complexities. Um, one of the members of our open design working group, uh, H.R. Mendes, who might be here, I'm not sure, I don't, know, don't see him in the room, but uh, uh, awesome. Um, I was really impressed with the conversation. Oh, hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Haven't met him in person. Um, we had a conversation via our discussion list a few weeks ago um, about the political aspect of open design and whether there is one today. I mean, maybe that's been lost. Um, and it started a really interesting debate. And Ator wrote in that conversation that he believes open design should always be considered in its political dimension because transparency, collaboration, and the release of resources are strategies that do not fully guarantee the balance and social justice of society in and of themselves. And I mean, I think that's a good question. Are, are designers out of the actual debate today? Uh, can we not be activists and designers at the same time? Maybe not. Um, in Open Design Now, uh, an Israeli industrial designer named Ronan Kashidin wrote that he believes open design should be a part of a larger political agenda one that advocates for greater transparency in all of our products. Uh, he says this is the mission of uh, the Open Design Lab at the WAG Society, um, which I would agree with. Uh, they aim to empower people to make and understand products for more transparency. Um, and I think in the same line of Open Data's promises seeking greater transparency, the agenda of Open Design could be to increase transparency in production chain and to educate others about what that means. But if transparency and the sharing of free and open methodologies is this important, how can we reflect that in, in our products, in the work that we're doing? Um, I think the free font manifesto here gives a really good example of this sort of politics. Um, you know, they, they say that a free font must be freely given by its maker. And to be truly free, it should be available to everyone, not just to a circle of friends or to the buyers of a particular software package or operating system. Um, and that's both a very flawed statement and a very not flawed statement at the same time, I think. It's quite interesting what, what they're saying there and could be quite transformative, um, especially when we think about design tools and how they are made. Um, this is just the quote from Ator again. Which leads me to my next point about open design is I believe right now it's increasingly becoming a form of source code and must be, must be looked at as such. Um, Ator said at the Open Design and Shared Creativity Congress here in 2012, which I'm sure many of you were at, um, that open design is becoming, to a large extent, the extrapolation of free software's methods and goals in the field of design. Uh, this is understandable that its products, uh, proposals arise from tools that enable collaboration and also look at how design work should be shared. Um, And in their attempt to give the first statistical analysis ever <coughs> of open design products, um, a group of <coughs> researchers there, um, Kirsten Kalka, Christina Reich, and Cornelius Herstadt, 
Founded in the field of open design in the late 2000s, tangible objects were developed in a very similar fashion to software. And they say one could even call design itself a form of source code for physical objects. An example of this happening in real life quite recently, which I was glad to see, um, was an open design pop-up store in the city of, of Graz in 2011. Um, the pop-up store had a full digital workflow. So the shop interior, as well as all of the products you see there, were sold entirely based on computational fabrication and on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and then they were produced locally in the region of Steria, which is around Graz, and which profited from the added manufacturing a great deal. So it was a very positive process, both for the local community and for people engaging digitally and for the people who decided to come together to do this pop-up. Um, another great example is, you know, the famous Instructables restaurant by uh, Arne Hedricks and Bas van Abel, um, which I wasn't able to go to. Did anyone here go to it? A few. Yeah, it looks great. Um, it was done by the, the Vag Society's Fab Lab again. Um, and its description is that it's the first open source restaurant in the entire world uh, because everything you see, use, and eat is downloaded from instructables.com. Everything. Uh, yeah, it's an experiment in digesting free internet culture, they say. <laughs> um, and they say, in, in our restaurants, you will go home knowing how to make the food as well as the furniture. Um, and they've been uh, implemented all over the world, which I think is, is quite inspiring. And this leads me to my next point, where I believe open design is increasingly a form of pure, sure you all know already. Uh, commodities are, are symbol-laden objects that satisfy human needs. And their subjective values as products of human labor are constantly negotiated and renegotiated through being exchanged and acquired. So that means every day when we're having these kind of transactions, we are doing a cultural remix of our own. And I think this becomes quite interesting when mixed with ideas about pure production from other people, such as Yochai Blenkler, um, grandfather of the floss movement, I would say, um, who wrote in Kosa's Penguin that he believes the advantages of pure production are improved identification and allocation of human creativity i.e. the remixing of this transaction. And he's saying these advantages are salient because human creativity itself is becoming salient. Uh, he's, he's talking about the, the information age and the internet, and he's saying that production now comprises the combination of pre-existing informational and cultural inputs, i.e. old transactions about ownership, with new ideas about human creativity. So that means we, we're able to remake things in their own image right now as we speak. Uh, I think another, another good point there is that um, Lawrence Lessig, founder of Creative Commons, uh, augments this quite nicely by saying that he believes there exists today not just the commercial economy, but also a sharing economy. I mean, he writes about this a lot lately and lectures about this a lot increasingly. Um, and he believes culture is no longer just regulated by price, but by you know, social relations, i.e. cultural capital, but also by something else. And he's saying these new social relations are not simple. Indeed, these relations are insulted by the simplicity of price. In, uh, in his most recent book, he gives a nice anecdote about being on a plane next to a really young hacker who has a massive library of pirated DVDs. And because Lessig himself is against pirating, he says, um, could I loan one of those from you for $5? And he said he'd never seen a greater look of disgust or anger than he got from that young hacker who was offended that, that Lessig was trying to give him money because he believed it's a, it's a shared collective good and that, why, why would we need money for that sort of transaction? Um, an example of this sort of design-based peer production, uh, which I find quite inspiring, um, and re renegotiation of human labor itself, uh, is this, I, it's called a makerspace, community space, media lab, it has various names, called Made in Calio. Um, and this is a group of designers and hackers, uh, producers and, and old anarchists, you could say, um, in Finland, who I met, who have decided to collectively own, build, and share a space, and to collectively own, build, and share designs together as a community. They equally share a percentage of all profits. Um, they, they negotiate each day what they want those profits to go towards in the space. Um, and they really, uh, they, they help enrich the local community. This is in sort of a bad area of town in Finland, and they've really enriched that, that space, and I think made it, made it quite an inspiring space to be. As you can see, um, they have events where 
a lot of young people and people interested in this sort of work come out from all over the world to, to learn from them. And I think this leans to my next point quite well, which is that, I mean, I think open design itself is going through a process of relearning, and therefore uh, those of us engaged in this space are relearning also. Um, also in his new book, Remix, Lawrence Lessig writes that our past teaches us about the value of Remix. We need to relearn that lesson. The present teaches us about the potential of a new hybrid economy, one where commercial entities leverage value from sharing economies. And the future can benefit both from this commerce and from this sort of new communities. That's the book, which I think is, I think it's quite an interesting representation of some of the stuff that we're all talking about right now, whether you agree or disagree with it. It's, it's available for free online. I would recommend checking it out. And this leads to, I think, an interesting methodology and conversation that's happening around connected learning, um, which is championed by people like Joy Ito um, at the MIT Media Lab and, and by a lot of people at Mozilla currently who are working with WebMaker. Uh, and this is a, a web of confusion up here, but um, to boil it all down, the, the main goal of connected learning is that there is a wide agreement that we need new models of education and co-learning and not simply new models of schooling. We need new visions of learning better suited to the increasing complexity, connectivity, and velocity of our new knowledge society and the information society we live within. And this applies directly to design practices as well as many other paradigms which they, they outline. Um, basically, they're asking for us to be mentors more in this sort of emergent pre-culture, peer culture, and, and networked culture that we're helping build. Uh, one of the pioneers in this movement is Mimi Ito, uh, Joy Ito's sister, which I didn't realize until like a few days ago, I'm amazed by that. <laughs> um, she's a famous cultural anthropologist um, who studies a lot about digital learning. And she says that one of the things the internet has given us the most of all is a complete abundance of knowledge. But how can we use that capacity and the capacity of our social networks as, as connected digital, digital native folk to bring new people together who want to learn together as a team? And I think that's basically what the traditional hacker ethos was all about. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, I wasn't really there at the time, I was a bit young, but uh, I, I really like um, how Chris Kelty, who spoke yesterday, I'm, I'm really sad I missed him, but um, he wrote a famous, famous book, Two Bits, which is a cultural anthropology of, of hacker and coder communities. Um, and in that, he, he brings up a really nice quote from Richard Stallman, one of the you know, pioneers of the hacker movement, who says that he believes Co-learning and, and peer networked learning is much like hacking because they're both a process of changing the limits of what's possible in a spirit of playful cleverness. And I really love that quote. And I think now we have an opportunity to be able to apply that spirit to contemporary tools that we work with. As designers working with open design tools, um, as people working with web native tools, uh, I think WebMaker is a great example of a series of web native tools that, that could be argued to be open design tools but you know, um, they aren't like OpenOffice uh, or LibreOffice. They're, they're things that you only engage with through your browser. But for many of them, the source code is freely available. Um, they use HTML5 and CSS and things that, are, that are, they're hoping will be quite universal. And their goal is to help the next generation of web users become web makers, designers, and also producers through the, the open web, uh, through the implementation of new web literacy tools, such as the web native popcorn, .js, which it looks like um, Nikos talked about yesterday with you guys. Um, also Thimble and X-Ray Goggles, which are two um, web literacy tools that allow people to open up the back end of the internet and engage with it. Uh, did anyone here have a website on GeoCities when they were younger? <laughs> awesome, yeah. I mean, that, GeoCities is how I learned how to be a web designer. It was just me late at night when my parents thought I was in bed. Uh, <laughs> pouring through these websites, uh, MySpaces and, and different like GeoCities homepages and trying to figure out how do these people make this? Like, how do they do these crazy hodgepodges of, of strange mashups? <laughs> um, and my, my first GeoCities site had a lot of wolves just like this one <laughs> and a lot of strange quotes just like this one. Um, and I think that's something that the new tools like Thimble, um, another part of WebMaker, are really trying to, they're trying to bring back that spirit, that spirit of playful cleverness. Um, they're, they're calling, the people at Mozilla are calling WebMaker a Swiss army knife for makers. And I think 
you know, this is the first part of that journey. Um, just looking at, the, looking at a web page and figuring out how it's made when you're, you know, 10 or 12 years old, that, that can be a really revolutionary moment for you. It definitely was for me. Uh, also, I think relearning through Remix is a big, is a big deal right now with Mozilla. Um, Popcorn Maker will allow you to take any, anything from YouTube or anywhere else that's a video and add whatever you want onto it. So it's, it's, it's inviting you to remix your own world and to rehash it and to relearn it and to share it with others as you see it, not as someone is delivering it to you. And I think this leads me to my last point, the last facet of open design that I see being increasingly important, and that is that open design is itself a form of culture, and it's an emerging culture that we're building together, and we really need to think about what that means. I think RIP, a remix manifesto by Brett Gaylor, is a really good example of the importance of us being self-reflexive as we build this culture. He's talking about remix culture, but what we need to remember is that culture always builds on the past, as he says there. And I think that this means that open design itself is more than just a new way to create products. Um, I think as a process and as a culture in itself, open design changes the relationships that we work with every day among people who make, use, and look after things. Um, all our decisions from now on need to take into account these complicated systems and the interactions between them, as, as John Thackeray says in Open Design Now book. And I think an example of, of this, of creating a new cultural narrative, is the Noun Project, project um, which I'm sure many of you use. I use it a lot as a designer in my work. Um, their aim, as a bunch of designers who are interested in, in open, openness, was to build a global visual language through openly licensed, freely offered images. Each designer licenses his own image as he would like, using a Creative Commons derivative, that everyone can understand and use. Um, and this is, this is a bit more revolutionary side of their work, is that they want to create a silent language that speaks louder than words, that teaches us new things about what our culture can be, and that allows us to communicate across cultures and across languages, which is something that would, would be nice to do here, since I unfortunately do not speak Spanish and I can only speak in one language. That, that very much limits me and my uh, uh, benefit to people who aren't also speaking English. I think another great example of this sort of um, goal to inspire designers to remix their own culture together and to build a new culture um, is the public domain remix, which is currently getting started in France uh, with a colleague of mine, and this is a a partnership challenge run by the Open Knowledge Foundation in France, and local communities there, and also with Wikimedia France. And its aim is to encourage people who are designers or maybe not designers yet, to remix public domain works in a creative way, using interdisciplinary weird approaches. So rather than following the same medium, they encourage people to shift from one medium to another. Um, and a great example of this is, is the Open. As, I can't say it in a French accent, they're, they're French, but. Um, it's much more elegant when they say it. Uh, but this has been exhibited all over the world, and I think it's, it's a really interesting example of, of how we as designers can, can mash all these things together and do something inspiring with all these things we're learning and absorbing and talking about. Um, and basically, this is a, it's a mechanical software created by a, a collective in Paris um, who reappropriate old bicycle parts and old, old bits of garbage from around Paris, and they make all these strange machines with them. Um, which have both physical and digital elements and are all based on open software and open prototypes. Um, and this one produces abstract artworks. There's it producing an artwork, which automatically become part of the public domain even as they are created, without them having any choice in the matter, which I think raises an interesting conversation right there. Um, and each of these artworks are based on a series of public domain materials, um, which are quite, quite varied, including um, Archimedes' pendulum, uh, the harmonograph, um, Walter Bowersfield's Geodesic Dome and the works of La Fontaine. And that's one of the, one of the productions there. Um, basically, you, you interact with the machine and it, it creates this thing as you're watching and then the thing is spit out and it goes immediately digitally onto the internet as a public domain work that other people can then remix. And this, is, is, this comes to the end of what I'm going to say. I think this is what design is to me. It's, it's a thing of many faces, a beast of, of many types. And I think it's something that is equally inspiring and frustrating in its complexity. And 
as a result, there's, there's many different ways that we can engage with it. Um, these are some of the ways that I'm engaging with it as a field, and these are some of the ways that I would love for you guys to, to join me in engaging with it. Um, especially with WebMaker, which is in very early days, a lot of the code needs a lot of work, um, and a lot of the communities need to be enriched more. So if you want to get involved with WebMaker as designers, let me know. Um, I would love for you guys to join the Open Design Working Group and the discussions we're, we're having there um, to make them even more fruitful and to help us build the definition um, and, and get it out to a wider audience that's not just us in this room, but also other designers who maybe aren't working with open concepts yet, but might find different aspects of that inspiring. Um, yeah, and also, I mean, mostly I would like you to argue with me and, and let's have a debate about, I mean, what, what we think that open design is and what it should be and whether whether the seven things I've uh, introduced are correct or whether you think I'm totally out of the wrong tree. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think you guys have a lot of, of power here and a lot of um, wisdom to share with me just as much as I'm sharing what I think with you. So yeah, it would be great to have a discussion now. Um, I don't know if you want to facilitate it. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. That was um, a very interesting and ex uh, inspiring uh, seven points. Uh, I think knowing who's in the audience, there should be questions. Okay. Um, Kat, uh, before I ask this question, uh, I'm just, uh, can someone bring up a translation device so that you can ask questions in Spanish and English um, so that she can hear the translation. I know, but maybe someone else would like to speak Spanish. And we have the luxury of having simultaneous translation. So that's all. Thank you. So. Well, just to be perverse and take some work off of the translators, I'll make my question in English and then translate myself. Uh, <laughs> Innovative. <laughs> I, I don't mean to be too facetious, maybe just a little bit, but um, I couldn't help but notice your talk is peppered with the word open all over the place. And is it a conscious choice uh, to use these, um, I mean, the open source definition and all this history of calling these things open rather than free uh, has a bit of politics. Uh, of politics behind it, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, some people were saying, when we use the word freedom, we scare off business. So let's find a word that's a bit more neutral, a bit less scary, and they settled for open. So the um, question would be, where do you stand on that? And should I just say the question in Spanish right now? Sure. Um, decía que la plática estaba, la, las diapositivas estaban llenas de la palabra abierto, open, ¿no? Y, y para mí, porque más o menos estaba ahí cuando se dio la decisión entre la definición de open source y la de, la, el concepto de software libre que manejaba la Free Software Foundation, para mí el hecho de usar una palabra y no la otra tiene una cierta carga política. Y le preguntaba a ella, pues, ¿qué, qué opina al respecto? Thank you. Um, I think that that's, that points to a very interesting discussion that has continued to be had I mean, around the terminology and the linguistics of the words that we use. Um, I myself identify as a, a floss hacker and designer. Um, I, I, would, I would use the word free when I'm talking about stuff that I believe in. Um, I, I only use floss software and I think, that, I think the, the history of the floss movement is much more inspiring than the history of the open source movement, which in a way was, um, you could say, a derivative of the floss movement, which you know, originally inspired it. Um, but I think the word open can be important in certain conversations because it is the best umbrella term for those of us that lie on different sides of that paradigm, of that ideological paradigm. Um, a lot of my designer friends wouldn't necessarily call themselves floss hackers or designers, but they would call themselves open designers. So. Well, I think for those of us who identify as floss, open is a bit of a weak term. It is nevertheless, I think, the least um, scary term for people who are maybe newer to this, this field. And I think those people, not today, I think today I'm talking to, to experts in the field, but usually 
people I'm engaging with are people who are just learning about what this all is. Um, and I think usually I, I like to give them the, the history lesson and the importance of floss lesson a, a bit after I give them the importance of openness lesson. Um, so yeah, that, that was not to um, by any means uh, disrespect the, the floss movement at all. But I think, I mean, I think that that's a conversation that we're continuing to have. And the Open Knowledge Foundation, for example, uses the word open as a standard for the same reason, because they want to unite people from different communities. Um, but they, you know, they have controversial ideas about uh, like CCSA, share alike licenses. They don't like share alike licenses. Whereas I personally would say I do. I mean, I, mean, I think that there's a lot of interesting debates that we continue to have on, on the mailing list of the Open Knowledge Foundation about why that is and you know, why we're using certain terms and why we're, um, I think, championing certain licenses over others. Hi, thanks for the talk. Hi. I wonder if we should be talking about design at all, because, you know, um, if you're designing something, someone else has to make it, right? And um, I know certainly in my own practice as a designer, I don't really like to talk about that too much because I'm just one person who's part of a productive, you know, a, a kind of effort to produce something and it's just one part of a, a wider process. So I guess the question is, why not talk about open production within which design is one part? Hmm. And, and I suppose part of my hesitation here is that, you know, when you, when you focus on design, it seems a bit like you're maybe trying to um, elevate the designer, I suppose, hmm. into something that's maybe a bit or special and trying to preserve a particular kind of capital maybe, which isn't really helpful in the context of what it seems you're trying to do through the open design movements. Hmm. Yeah, I would agree. It would be amazing if there could be one term that we could all use, I mean, that united us all. Like, I, I think makers helps, get, helps us get there a little bit, but there are still designers who would say, well, I'm not a maker because I only do digital prototypes or something. Um, I mean, e even, even the, li the limitations of, we had the longest name ever in the topic stream at the Open Knowledge Festival because we had to use every word related to design ever, and that was because of a massive argument amongst a lot of the designers and, and makers and fabbers and manufacturers and producers who helped build that stream because some would say, well, makers or fabbers aren't going to come to this stream unless they're mentioned in the topic. And others would say, yeah, but we just need one word. We need one word. The public doesn't care. Let's just think of something that unites us. And, I mean, we weren't able to come to a consensus. So I think if you, if you have a term that maybe we could all use, that would be, this is a good place to like bring it up because I would use it definitely. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're definitely that. <laughs> no, 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 I disagree. <laughs> so what do you disagree about? I don't self-identify as a I think it's very... Could you speak in a microphone? I find this tendency to sort of, for, for people who are busy with digital type technology to self-identify either as nerds or geeks, mm -hmm. very, very dangerous and negative. Like, I don't, I've never considered myself a nerd, and I feel it's a, something that keeps digital technology uh, marginalized, because it's like, people who don't self-identify as such can safely keep thinking, ah, it's for the nerds. Hmm. Yeah, I think there's a complicated politics of identity of people trying to um, take the word back and, and remix it in a way, in a, in a cultural sense, to say, yeah, I am a nerd and I'm proud of that. It's no longer has a negative connotation, but I think also it can be, it can be equally limiting because we all have different connotations of what a word means, and you can't assume by using a term that everyone else understands what that term means or that they have the same linguistic or cultural background. So yeah, I think it's complicated. <laughs> Another question. Um, regarding your presentation and your um, call for argument, I would just argue that uh, your uh, slide about the free font manifesto and can do more harm than good because uh, as far as I know, the original... Um, yeah, the original one, um, I don't know if Ellen Lupton has updated since, 
but it's actually a manifesto for free, as in cost um, fonts, and not actually open fonts. And uh, mm. as you mentioned, it's fonts that are meant to be um, shared and distributed, but there is no mention about the, the rest of the four freedoms as specified by the canonical definition. Mm. And lastly, um, it's almost a charity uh, appeal, like what if a few digital type foundries on earth gave away one good typeface as a gift, and like the scratching of great to good is a kind of asking for charity that many people involved in the actual Libre font uh, movement might um, not take that lightly. So I would just make that remark uh, about your presentation that is the only point that I would take issue with. Mm. Thank you. No, that's good feedback. I, I shouldn't. Uh I shouldn't by any means say that this is a universal example of, of what the free font movement is. I think for me, this is the most um, mainstream example. Like it's an example that my, my mom knows about, for example. I mean, which it is in its way nice because it, it introduces her to the movement a little bit. But I would, <laughs> what I should do is then say there's some really good free font movements that you should look at after, which, which have you know, a stronger political and I think commons-based methodology behind their work. Because you're, you're right, this is a bit, it's a bit simplistic and um, I think, well, it, it's catchy, it makes sense to people in the public who are you know, just first engaging with this sort of stuff. Um, it is a bit, it, it's lacking a bit in like the longer term work that it's trying to do. Before you, I ask a question. <laughs> um, you sort of skipped the question why open design, assuming that somehow, even when we didn't agree what that was, um, would be in favor of that. Uh, but can you say something about the need for definition? Because I think that's maybe something we can discuss. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, I guess the definition in itself answers the why of open design before it even starts to engage with the deeper issues of how do we unite our, our work as designers? Um, and I think the, the why of open design is something that we're still debating in the discussion list and in the workshops we're doing because everyone has a different why. And I mean, do we use all of the whys or we, do we just make there be one unified why like we were saying earlier with, with terminology and linguistics? Um, I think because there's many different needs and different, different approaches to, to openness and to free movements, um, the complexities of, of what is most important in all of those needs and, and wants is, is in itself very complicated. So that, that's something we're still working on. You still think it's necessary to have a definition? Like as, in what way is the definition uh, useful in this movement? Um, the, I think, seeking for the definition, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, well, as I said, there's some other really great definitions out there, like the open definition, the open source hardware definition. Um, which are still being updated. They have very rich communities, um, people translating them into every language. I think the open design and whatever else is under design movement doesn't yet have a definition that's our universal thing that we can refer people to. Um, so like an open data geek could refer people to the open definition when they say, well, why are you interested in open content? But we currently have a very outdated open design definition from the early 2000s, which I, I personally, I mean, this is, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel that definition does not, engage with contemporary issues that we're, that we're talking about today. So that, I mean, that is why we've tried to start this open design definition. And that's also why it's taking a long time for us to do, because it takes a lot of consensus and collaboration and community building and discussions to even get to the point where we could do version one, which, which has just been released online. Um, but it's very much a work in progress, and I, I hope it will continue to be a living document. Well, um, not so much a question as a comment, and it was uh, a bit provoked by uh, his, in his um, intervention, and it's meant to be a bit of a provocative comment too. So, <laughs> it was, he was complaining about how the words nerd and geek were at some point quite negative, and I remember that. I still lived a, a little bit of that. And like a lot of words like nigger, slut, geek, a lot of words like that, the community that is being attacked can do this kind of like uh, mental jujitsu and say, okay, I take the word back. Hmm. Now it's no longer an insult. Now it's a term that I appropriate, right? So, but in, in changing, in, in appropriating this word, and I, I do uh, see his point, it's gone from being a negative term to being an elitist term. 
uh, mm. something that scares people a little bit away. The mm. attitude that he was complaining about is something that I come from a background of mathematics and was pointed out to me a long time ago. If in a reasonably decent school somebody cannot read, they are, you know, almost a bit of a moron. How can this person not know how to read properly? Mm. Ah, but if they can't do maths, that's no problem because most people can't do maths anyway. So why should any particular person be decent in maths? Now, um, you know, for a long time, I saw this as a, as a very, as a problem, as a, as a harsh problem. For a few years now, maybe not so much. Hmm. Um, in proprietary commercial production, you value efficiency and hyper-production, maximization of pretty much anything they, that they, can, they, they consider positive. And in material terms, when you hyper-produce, it comes with environmental degradation. In, cultural, um, in the cultural arena, when you hyper-produce, for me personally, that really raises the, 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 the noise to signal ratio. It floods the, the, it floods the, the internet or whatever medium of communication you're using with too much production. Now, at some point I decided, why does everybody need to know how to solve mathematical problems? When did mathematics become that important that everybody needs to be able to do this? And I would ask the same of digital technologies. Why does everybody need to be an expert in digital production of whatever? Not everybody needs to be an oil painter. Not everybody needs to be a sculptor. So one of the positives for me of free or open uh, culture production is that it takes away some of the commercial incentive. And so it takes some of the incentive to hyperproduce away. If I'm not going to make a lot of money, then I speak when I have something to say, not just because I need to speak. And in the same vein, I would argue that not everybody needs to know how to say a certain kind of thing. Actually, if there aren't too many, I'm a bit happy. I don't have so much incredible stuff that I need to see, right? Hmm. <laughs> so there was many questions, but also answers. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I propose uh, we close uh, this uh, session for now. Um, Kat will be around uh, all day tomorrow, so try finding her uh, <laughs> Please either do. tomorrow or uh, uh, through her work at Mozilla. Maybe you can put yeah, up can go back your slide that. again. I want to thank you very much for uh, another very interesting session uh, and questions and answers. And see you back here in this room in 10 minutes. Yeah. Thank you.